Welcome to Healthcare Musings, a podcast dedicated to the discussion of critical care and healthcare in general. Here's your host, Dr. Hesham Hasabal. Hey everybody, happy to have you with me. All right, so in honor of Sepsis Awareness Month, I wanted to kind of go over uh, the definition of sepsis, and it depends on what insurance company a patient has, uh, and I and I'm not and I'm not being facetious. So, for a very long time, sepsis was defined as two or more criteria from the systemic inflammatory response syndrome plus known or suspected infection. So SIRS, we call that SIRS, plus two or more or uh, two or more signs of SIRS plus known or suspected infection, that's sepsis. And SIRS is a very long list, but typically it's fever or hypothermia, tachycardia, uh, tachypnea, high respiratory rate, low blood pressure, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that fall under the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So if you had two or more of those plus infection, or you know, known or suspected, that's sepsis. That's the old definition of what we call sepsis 2. Um so, for example, somebody who has the flu and a fever of 102 with a heart rate of 100, according to that old definition, is septic. As a critical care specialist, you know, we see sepsis every day. It's the number one diagnosis that we see in the ICU. Um, it's one of the highest mortality um, diagnoses in the ICU. Someone who comes to the hospital with the flu and a fever of 102 and a heart rate of 102 is not septic in my mind as an, as an intensivist, right? And that's the inherent problem with the SIRS plus infection de- definition. And so in 2016, it's been eight years already, uh, a, a group of researchers got together and they redefined sepsis as organ dysfunction as a result of a dysregulated host response to infection. As an intensivist, I was like, okay, duh, tell me what I don't know. And that's still closer to the definition of what we see in the intensive care unit, uh, sepsis. For example, someone who comes in with a urinary tract infection has kidney failure, altered mental status, and shock. That's sepsis, right? That, That is what I think of when I when I put sepsis in my head, right? And and it's organ failure because of the infection, because of the body's response to the infection. That's what now is called sepsis three. So commercial insurance companies follow sepsis three, and they're technically right, it is evidence based, and I and I I suspect, and this is cynical it may be cynical on my part, I suspect that they like sepsis three, not because they're up with the evidence. Rather, it's because it's harder to make to call someone septic with sepsis three than opposed to sepsis two. So, and sepsis three has a whole thing called you know how can you define organ failure? Well, it's by what's called the SOFA score, S O F A, the sepsis related organ failure assessment score. There are six things in that score. It is um, blood pressure, oxygenation, as measured by the PaO2 over FiO2 ratio. Um, mental status as measured by the Glasgow Coma Scale, serum creatinine, um, serum uh, platelets, uh, and um, I always forget the, the 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 sixth one. So it's it's uh, and uh, so it's oxygenation, mental status, serum creatinine, platelets, bilirubin, and blood pressure. Those are the six things, right? So. You know, and the higher, the more, the higher the, the like the worse the organ failure, the higher the SOFA score. And if you have a SOFA score or two of two or more compared to baseline, that's sepsis. Okay, so that's harder to to classify. So in the old definition, a person with flu, fever, and tachycardia would be septic. With a new definition, they would not. In the old definition, someone with a urinary tract infection. And again, fever and tachycardia is septic in the new definition, not necessarily. And so, it's, and so I, I see the commercial insurance companies love to use sepsis-3 because it's more strict. And on some level, I kind of agree with it being more strict. Um, it causes confusion, however, because CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, 
they use sepsis too. And they are holding clinicians like me accountable in measuring the SEP bundle, like the, um, the bundle of sepsis management, based on, se- on sepsis too. Right, And now it's part of value-based purchasing for hospitals where if we don't do well enough on the sepsis bundle, we can get potentially penalized with payment. And so it's, it's, it's quite confusing. And, and, in, and this is the reality. And so my advice is know your, which is the p- title of this episode, is know your sepsis. Um, you have to pay attention to the face sheet. You have to look at who is paying for the care. Is it traditional fee-for-service Medicare or is it a commercial insurance plan such as Medicare Advantage? Because the definition of sepsis may be different. Um, And it hasn't, you know, sepsis 3, although it's been eight years now and I think people kind of understand that it really makes sense as a definition, it hasn't been universally accepted among clinicians. Uh, And so that just adds to the confusion. I wish... They would just pick one. Uh, I wish CMS would maybe pick <laughs> um, sepsis three uh, just to make it uniform. And I wonder though if they're really trying to cast a very broad net to try to elevate this care of sepsis across the country. And perhaps that's why they really haven't come to sepsis three and uh, and are still using sepsis two. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. But just at the end of the day, you have to understand that you you depending on who's paying the bill in the hospital will determine which definition, sepsis 2 or sepsis 3. Anyway, thanks so much for your time and attention. And uh, until next time, Dr. Hashem Hasabala signing off on Healthcare Musings. Thank you for listening. To get every episode delivered directly to your inbox, please subscribe at healthcaremusings.com.